All right, tell me about functions now. That's tonic, you said. Mm -hmm. Opening tonic. And? Awesome. Tonic over here, too. Now, that's, you know, in a way, these are two very different jobs to begin and to end. But it is the same place. So showing it as T in both places, tonic, for these T for short there, but tonic as a home base makes sense to then show it as the starting point and the place to which you return, right? No. I mean, it shows that it is home for us because it's the place that we go on and wake up from and then head out into the world and then come back to, you know, so in a sense that's, that shows that it's home. So I'm glad that the beginning idea and the ending, the beginning of ending and beginning and ending is captured with one symbol. That's a good thing, I think. Do you see what I mean by that? Plus it's the same chord, right? So yeah, it should be. But, um, okay, so tell me a little bit about, how about two chords? Generally speaking, what do they do? They preempt into the five. Good. They get you ready, they lead into a five chord. Do all twos do that job? No. no. Yeah, like, um, I love the endings of, like, the, um, let's see, what are some cool pieces that do, the, oh, Tristan and Isolde does this at the very end of the opera. What kind of cadence is that? It's an authentic. Those are five one. Triton substitutions. That's not that, but... That'd be like a flat T. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so what is this called? It's kind of like, it's modeled after this. Plagal. Plagal, yeah, plagal. So this is a plagal two going to our tonic and it, from a different place, but it does still have a strong pull there, especially because he made mine. He, he borrowed it from the minor, and that gives him a wonderful tritone chord, but... Isolate it so you can really hear. Ah, oh, that sounds like resolution, doesn't it? It works so nicely. Now, if it hadn't been fully diminished, I mean half diminished, it would not have the same pull because you now have a fourth, a perfect fourth, instead of the tritone. And that just doesn't quite have the same effect. But borrowing flat six gives it real pull. the bench and played what job here? Predominant. Predominant. But it came off the bench and played a different job over here. Two different jobs that it can play. Function is a role or a job that a chord plays. So when we're talking about harmonic function, we're talking about the jobs that chords play in their team. And their team is this progression that gets us through a phrase. Good. Yeah, okay, so what's the job of the five chord here? Um, it leads us into tonic, and we call that function dominant function. In any case, you've got flat six, and it's the motor that sort of drives the chord onward and says, hey, you've got to resolve this thing. you got a tritone here, and you're going to have to resolve it. And so you do it. So in major, you don't have quite the same effect. You don't have that same drive. But in minor, with the lowered six and the tritone that it creates, you do. Okay, how about, what's the little engine that could, the, the, the motor that runs five into the one and creates that sense of resolution? We've not just got five, but we have scale degrees five, seven, two, and, in this case, four, because this is a seventh chord here. I think it has two, like the four going down to three and seven to one. Yes. But we need to yeah, and if we had to emphasize one thing out of these two for the 5-7, it would be that leading tone, because that's going to be there even without a seventh tone. And it's that half-step relationship. In both cases, see the half-step? Half-step down, half-step up. So some people even talk about flat six as being the downward leading tone. <laughs> it leads downward, and that's true, by half-step. The leading tone, the leading tone, leads us up by half step and creates that pull. And again, yeah, 
in this context, we happen to have that tritone, and so resolving it means wedging again. In a sense, melodic resolutions are the engine that drives the progression where it goes, and we can think of the, the harmony as fallout, ways of making that note part of something bigger, but they're sort of glued onto it, the thing that connects the stuff one to the next, the sort of vital connected tissue <laughs> between the chords is actually melodic connections. So melody drives it in a sense. Now we're going to move to this chord, which we're going to view as a way of elaborating the opening tonic. Not as, yeah, we could write dominant, and that's true, but we can be more subtle and say that it's an embellishing chord. It's a chord that doesn't really get us to something new, but it just decorates an old thing. So I like to talk about my, my day. I just bore you to death. So in the morning on a Thursday, I go to the side of my house, I grab my garbage can, and I drag it to the street leave it there for the garbage people, and I go back home. And when I come home, they better be ready to give me some hugs and kisses, because I'm home. No, not at all. I've gone nowhere, right? I've just gone to the curb and back, and nobody's going to greet me. So, you know, maybe, if they haven't seen me yet. <laughs> maybe. But, I mean, that's, I haven't gone anywhere. I just went to the curb, right? I haven't gone really away. And this cord has not really departed very far from its home base. It went to the garbage and it came home. Now, when I went to Japan, this is solid, root position, stand on its own, establish itself, assert itself, dominant. Not wimpy, six, five. <laughs> now, this is, this is establishing another place so that when you come back to the one, it's like, okay, you have arrived. You've gone away to something solid enough to stand on its own, and then you come home. And, you know, when you've been away for a while, you do want the hugs and kisses. You've been gone, you know. So now, when you return, it's a big deal. Same thing here. When I come back to that time, that's an arrival. And this is solidly asserting itself as something new, new ground. And so when you come home, it's significant. Okay, you went away, but not a big deal. So we're going to make a big distinction between these two. And it has to do with melody. Melody plays a role in how we hear different chords. Inversion plays a big role too. Let's, let's acknowledge that. It's destabilized by being inverted. And needs resolution. But another factor here, so instability, inversion, that is a factor. But another factor is the melodic context. What's the main melody note here? for this chord. I want you to notice that melody plays a role in both outer parts, and then I'd like you to give me the punchline instead of me doing it. How does the melody move? Main first note is? And then it goes to? G. And then? A flat. Those are the main notes. And you see how it's moving? By step. What kind of motion is this? Neighboring motion. Although, we put it down here when it's the chord and not the note. What's this kind of motion here? Passing motion. So we've got two kinds of embellishing motion in the outer parts. Okay, so what does that have to do with our interpretation of this chord? Put it all together for me. Explain this interpretation based on what's going on. I heard somebody take it. Oh, it's also passing. It's kind of stepping. I don't know. It's yeah. It's not departing as far. Uh-huh. A stepping stone, uh -huh. a yeah. stepping stone to, to... The predominant. predominant that comes there, though. This is a stepping stone to just get us back, to back, back home. So it's really just an embellishment <laughs> of the embellishment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you blow through a chord and you're just on your way to another, it doesn't have the same weight for us. You don't feel it as asserting itself. <laughs> so the resolution isn't nearly the same either in, in its weight. Uh, departure, the departure isn't so great. So when we move through it, 
it can make this sound very transitory, on its way somewhere, instead of real contrast with the tonic. And this, see how that captures it? It says we're basically embellishing one thing, it's tonic, and we're embellishing it. Now notice that we don't use the P to label the chord, we use N because we use the bass line. We feel like the bass line trumps the top part. The bass line seems like harmonic support more than the top. But don't forget the top part. That's exposed, obvious. I mean, your, your focus is on the melody probably, right? <laughs> it's mainly up there. And uh, so it's overall motion, ascending by step, passing through that chord, helps that chord sound like it is not as prominent, but it is something that gets you somewhere else. These are the most important chords, and this is a decorative accessory, right? your ba handbag or whatever it might be. Yeah. Or your phone, right? Everybody's got a phone now. And they got these awesome patterns on them and everything. This is this is the case on the phone, okay? You don't need that case. Well some of you do because it's padded. And you <laughs> dropped your phone and you know that you actually do need it. But you know it, it didn't have to be that cool design. This is a cool design. And the essential thing is the phone, the tonic. It's the weighty thing. This is a little thing up above. So we put the tonic down lower, distill the, the weightier things, and show the embellishing things like this 5-6 by an embellishing symbol, a symbol that shows the kind of motion in the bass. So two dominants. Yes, they're both dominant. But they mean something very different. This is embellishing, and this is a stand on its own dominant, asserting itself in a way that the inverted one doesn't. Okay, so remember that. Melody plays a role, even when we're dealing with harmonies, because it gives us some of those resolutions, and gives us the, the motor, the engine that moves the progression from one thing to another. And it also plays a role, melody plays a role, in how we hear the harmony in the first place, especially when we focus on those outer parts, because those are the most prominent, and the melodic motion in there can qualify how we hear the chords in the first place, and that's important for us. I like to think of this as progression, cutting new territory, and prolongation. And those aren't my terms, but I like those two terms. They both start with P, <laughs> but they're very different. Because, you know, if you go out on the ice tonight and your wheels turn, you might not grip for a while. Those tires might slip for a good bit. And that's kind of what's going on here. Spinning wheels. Yes, there's motion. Yes, there's change. But it's your tire. Your tire is moving, but you aren't. But when you finally get traction, you move. This is the car in motion. This is motion that doesn't advance the progression. This is motion that does, and it gets you a cadence. See the difference? There's motion in each, but which one really advances the progression? This one spins its wheels and gets you nowhere in the end. This one gives you a sense that you have really departed and gone somewhere, and then when you get back to the one, you've arrived. You've gotten somewhere significant. Okay, so melody plays a role in both of those things, progression and prolongation, but in very different ways. One thing to be aware of with harmonic function is that these scale degrees, yes, they have power, but it's qualified by their position in the chord. And for this point, I am uh, dependent on Dan Harrison in a book about harmonic function. And uh, particularly, he's interested in very chromatic context, not this at all, but we can take this from his thinking. So here's a leading tone, scale degree seven. If it's the root, what's the chord? Five, six, five. If it's the root, though. Not the bass, but the root. Two. Oh, oh, seven. Then it's a seven chord, right? Yeah. What if it's the chordal third? So this is chordal third. Now we have a different chord. Five, six, seven. Right. And it could just be a five. We don't, I'm not going to say what position it's in. What if we make that scale degree seven, the leading tone, the chordal fifth? What's the chord? Three, two, 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you work yeah. through that? You see how that works? <laughs> that scale there? Um, that makes scale degree 3 our root as you go down. So here's scale degree 7, 5, 3. 3 is the root. Okay, now, oh, and let's do one more. So what if it's the chordal 7? What's the chord? If the leading tone is the 7th in the chord, it's a one. It's a one. Yeah, it's a one seven. Okay, now, do you see the changing effect that that leading tone has? When it's the root, does it determine where that chord is going to go? Yes. Its resolution is going to make it go to one, right? So these two, these two chords are dominant in function. How about the three chord? Can you tell? Because of this seven, can you say, oh, okay, I know what that chord's going to do? No. No. Three is very ambiguous. It could be dominant in function, but usually it's tonic. It's a substitute usually for a one-six chord, right? Okay, so it could be dominant, or sometimes, especially if I invert it, like if I make that a three-six, then it's just a, it sounds like an added, a five-and-six kind of a chord. So if I'm in C... Okay, so if I'm in C and um, I do this, and I, so what I'm doing is using a three right after a one chord. What would you say then? Yeah, I would too. I would say, hey, that's more of the same. Not a very significant change. I'm going to call it tonic. In that environment, that makes total sense. Now, and if I come from a real obvious dominant, I can do the same thing. So, if I come from a dominant and go, well, that sounds like a, a decent resolution, right? So that, I'm putting a seventh in there, making it sound a little jazzier, but that makes it sound like a tonic too. So usually it's going to be tonic. Now, to make it sound dominant-ish, I'm going to have to put five in the bass. So, like this. And now if I go there, it sounds like I just resolved it, right? So I've got five, seven, three, sound kind of dominant like so if I want to come from a like a two maybe and then I'll do this and go now did that sound dominant yeah good because here's what I did I went one two six and then back to one and that symbol almost seems silly it sounds more like five with an added six in there doesn't it very similar. Okay, so I can do it, and I know there's some romantic composers who are going to use various kinds of three as dominant functioning chords. All right, so not so dominant. I have to work hard to make it sound dominant. See what's going on? It's, he calls it the root or the agent here. It's the thing that, it's in the place that in that position, it becomes operative. It's activated as an agent. But here, it's just kind of an addition to the chord, fleshing it out. It blends in with the chord and has little role in determining where that chord's going to go. Okay, is the leading tone going to make you want resolution to tonic here? <laughs> no. no. Now it really is just an addendum, an accessory to the chord, and isn't in the driver's seat at all. So here, you've got the backseat driver, you will turn, 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 you know, and then they turn, and they go to the top. Here, it's like, they're driving. But here, they're a quiet backseat driver who does not offer opinions. And here, they're in the... They're asleep. <laughs> yeah, this is a sleeping baby here. I like that. Yeah. So, it, where the chord, where the note fits in the chord qualifies the strength of that scale degree. And that's that's good to keep in mind too. So because if I just left it at that, if C L three seven 
the leading tone is in the chord, it's going to drop. Well, no, it doesn't. I have to be sure that I'm just keep repeating I mentioned it. Crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a little addendum, but important um, footnote to what we're saying here.